Good evening, everyone. What I'm about to review may shock you. It may horrify you. It might even petrify you. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! It's time to review Frankenstein, guys. Frankenstein was released in 1931, directed by James Whale, and starring Colin Clive, May Clark, Boris Karlov, and Dwight Fry as Fritz. What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Jason. You're watching Backtrack Cinema, and welcome to my movie review of Frankenstein. It's a classic black and white horror awesomeness you can't go wrong with these classic universal monster movies i'll tell you that even though they may be slow they may be a bit dated and it's pacing and stuff like that and frankenstein i believe was the first one i mean boris karloff as frankenstein frankenstein's monster let's not forget it's actually the monster it's it centers around the doctor dr frankenstein right that's who frankenstein really is and i mean this movie just is so ahead of its time it's a timeless story. You know what I mean? You could tell this story, modernize it again and again and again and again. And it's just one of my favorite stories of all time. So essentially what you have is Dr. Frankenstein is obsessed with creating a living person by using assembled dead body parts. So let's just start off with the story, guys. The story's timeless. It is timeless. We have a lot of different themes in here. What Dr. Frankenstein is going through, I think in the story, his mother dies. And this gives him this obsession to create life. And that's what it is, right? The, the, the obsession, beware of scientific ambition. Once he creates this monster, Frankenstein, it's something he can't control. Frankenstein does not know who he is. He does not where he is, what he is. He's just acting on instinct. He has a lot of fear, but and he lashes out. And we have his assistant, Fritz. Fritz is awesome, but what he does is he, he smashes, he drops the, the brain jar, and he ends up using a, a, a psychopath's brain. He gets put into Frankenstein, so that couldn't be a problem, right? But you got these themes of obsession, playing God, being the creator, you know what I mean? And consequences of that. I mean, and where have we seen this before? Like, we could, if we look at Prometheus, you know, with David, you know, wanting to, you know, he was a creation. He wants to create that whole idea of creating life, you know, not being able to accept loss. When you can't accept loss, Dr. Frankenstein wants to create life and then playing God. And he's like, I know now I know what it's like to be God. Quite a statement, you know what I mean? And he comes around during the movie when he realizes that Frankenstein can't be controlled and all that. And then he has to take the monster out at the end so i love those themes but there's also another theme with frankenstein being this outcast not fitting in not knowing who he is where he is what time he's in like it's a combination of all these different dead parts with this psychotic brain and the scene with the little girl with the flowers you know what i mean this would have been terrifying back in the day when he you know she's throwing the the ends of the flowers in the lake and they're floating and he what does he do? He throws her in just to see. He thinking she's a flower. He threw, you know, that she'll just float. He has no clue the ramifications, no clue of morality. He just he just hears people coming after him and he gets the hell out of there. You know what I mean? He starts going after Dr. Frankenstein's, you know, uh soon to be wife and stuff like that. It's almost like he wants to be put out of his misery, but he's holding on to his life at the same time. It's so layered. It's so interesting. But being this outcast, how we could relate to Frankenstein. If you have ever been outcast, if you ever not fit into something, fit into a certain group. I think that's how this movie has stood the test of time. And Mary Shelley, you know, 18 years old back in 18 something when she wrote this thing. It just what an incredible uh, story. You know what I mean? Because we can relate to it so much with Frankenstein. The way this movie opens up too, I really do like Colin Clive in this. You know, where they're, they're at, there's a funeral, they're spying on him and Fritz and 
When they leave, they go to do some grave robbing because they need parts for Frankenstein. These movies were very theatrical. They were theatrical actors. They're, so they may seem over the top to you, but that was the style of acting back then. So when Fritz is pointing his head up and he's like, down, down, you fool, like this. <laughs> but I mean, that graveyard scene is so well done. And the black, just notice there's a lot of black under um, his eyes. The more humanity he starts showing, the more he starts realizing what he's done wrong, the more he starts owning up to his mistakes, the black goes away. That's really symbolic, obviously not by accident. And I love stuff like that in movies and the way fritz just goes up to the cross with the guy's head just hanging there and he cuts them down they put them in the wagon and they take off man complete inspiration to jason lives right jason lives borrowing from frankenstein i mean you could say jason lives as an extension of the classic universal monsters it really is man watch that movie in black and white you get that and it all comes from frankenstein man all comes from this first movie the production design is pretty crazy, man. It's got this disjointed, things are on a tilt, you know, unorganized kind of feel to it. These old black and white movies, you, they, they're doing something with the contrast, with the shadow, the light that I really like. It's pretty amazing. When we see, first see Frankenstein, when he first turns around, I tell you, that must have been jaw dropping. For some reason, the makeup back then, the way Boris Karloff wears the makeup, his performance, just outstanding. It is so hard to recapture Frankenstein, it seems like. And I think that has a lot to do with Boris Karloff. You know, Boris Karloff's physicality is pretty amazing. The way he just his arms are just hanging as if they are kind of new and they're just kind of loose. And the way he lumbers around, you know what I mean? And when he gets attacked, the way he can, he's got real physical strength. You know what I mean? But everything else he's doing, too, with his body language, when he's reaching for the sky, um, like I said, the scene with the little girl and everything like that, the way he snarls and grunts and everything like that, he could be terrifying and sympathetic all in the same breath. May sound easy, but let's let's face the facts. How many people have played Frankenstein really good? You know what I mean? And it's just, uh, I love Boris Car What he did with other characters, too, is is so great. But Frankenstein, man, and Jack Pierce in the makeup and everything like that just created something very, very special. And the practical effects, you know, not just the makeup, but the when they bring Frankenstein to life, right? With the lightning and everything, when they raise him up to the sky, that was all done really well. And how iconic is the It's Alive? You know what I mean? I think we all know that It's Alive, It's Alive. It's alive. And they actually had to cut that scene out where he says, now I know what it's like to be God. Because that too much for people, man. Too much for people. Too much. Right. And I think they released it in 1938, maybe the 50s. I, I'm not sure the dates, but they re-released the movie with the, the scenes back in there. The ending of the film where he has to take Frankenstein's monster out. That iconic shot of the torches and everything like that. What a trope now in monster movies and stuff. Dr. Frankenstein and Frankenstein are facing off against each other and he's got the torch and everything. It's an iconic shot. And I've said this before in my channel, the, the comparisons to First Blood, you know, Trotman being Dr. Frankenstein, Rambo being Frankenstein, where he has to take Rambo out at the end. Originally, that was the original story, but you could see all those comparisons I've done like a, a little short video on how Frankenstein really relates to First Blood. But man, I mean, the way he takes, you know, he burns the windmill at the end. And when he throws uh, Dr. Frankenstein down on the windmill, that, that the stunt for the back then, that was pretty amazing, man. For 1931, that was incredible, man. Incredible stunt work. However, they did it with a probably with a big mannequin or whatever. It works. It still works. It holds up all these years later. This movie's almost 100 years old, guys. It's just absolutely crazy, man. It's pushing 100 years old and how much it holds up. And you find we watch things today and you're just like, this doesn't hold up. But this movie holds up so well. So it's a quick watch, too, man. The movie's only like an hour and 10 minutes. It's a really quick watch. It's a, it's a fun watch, but it's just a... A timeless story, man. Absolutely timeless. I absolutely love Frankenstein. So I'm going to give Frankenstein from 1931 an A.
Well, why don't you guys let me know in the comments below what you think of Frankenstein. We'll have a great discussion on this black and white horror classic. Drop a like, subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. It really helps the channel out. And that's going to do it for me, guys. My name is JC. You're watching Backtrack Cinema. There'll be an end card right below for you guys to watch more horror reviews, rankings, whatever you like. Go down the rabbit hole and enjoy the channel, man. My name is Jason. You're watching Backtrack Cinema. I will see you next time, and I'll see you in the movies. Cheers.